if it's death that teaches us how to live. Let's talk about it with David Gibson on Steve Brown, etc. He's an old white guy, an author, broadcaster, and seminary professor who's sick of religion. And he's brought friends. Please welcome Steve Brown, etc. Hey, we're so glad that you're here. I say it all the time, and I mean it all the time. You always have a place at our table. And in case you're wondering, and you've just joined us, I'm Steve, the aforementioned old white guy. Matthew Porter is our executive producer. It's a new year, so Matthew is turning over a new leaf. Actually, a lot of leaves, and then eating those leaves <laughs> with ranch dressing. <laughs> and um, our producer, Jinx, is in his little glass booth. Jinx would uh, do New Year's resolutions, but hey, how do you improve on perfection? And, and, Dr. and humility. And Dr. George <laughs> Bingham is the president of Key Life. And our video director and one-man IT department, John Myers, is in his tech bunker. George focuses on all the numbers, and John just concentrates on the ones and the zeros. <laughs> I had to have somebody explain that to me. If you do and you give us a call, <laughs> I'll explain it to you. Yeah. And Kathy Wyatt, just of bit. course, is the soft feminine side <laughs> of the program. Uh, Kathy, Matthew wrote a sonnet to your bait good. You want to hear it? Oh, absolutely. How do I love thee? Let me count the weight. <laughs> 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 so bad. Uh, I want to hide too next week. know that for all of these very bad lines, Matthew Porter, our executive <laughs> producer, is responsible. I just want you to know that I wouldn't say things like what I just said on my own. <laughs> By the way, David Gibson, and I've been looking forward to this, is a member of Trinity Church in Aberdeen, Scotland, uh, a minister. Uh, he uh, serves co-editor from heaven. He came and sought her, and he's the author of reading the decrees, exegesis, election, and Christology, and Calvin and Barth. And uh, should you ever be in a hurricane or a flood, stand on that book and it'll keep you dry. <laughs> it's not exactly <laughs> the most exciting subject that will sell millions, but I'm sure it's profound. And David's newest book is called, and I hold it in my nicotine-stained fingers, is titled Living Life Backward, How Ecclesiastes Teaches Us to Live in Light of the End. Frankly, uh, I read, I spent the morning with this book, and uh, I read the opening paragraph which I will proceed to read to you and promise you that if you'll keep your dial where it is or your computer where it is, it'll be worth your while. But it doesn't start as an upper. Uh, David writes, I'm going to die. By the time you read... <laughs> by the if we time can't see you. You read these lines, I may even be dead. It's not that I have a virulent disease or terminal illness. A doctor has not pronounced on how I'm going to die. I don't know when I will die. I just know I will. I'm going to die. And so are you. But here is why I wrote the book, I'm Ready to Die. <laughs> well, you know, I read that and I thought, oh, man, this is going to be an upper. Um, you know, old people, and I'm old as dirt, don't like to talk about death. We live in denial, and we do our best to avoid it. And this book has forced me to look at it, and I might say 
with great insight and joy as I read it. I'm David, I'm a cynical old preacher, and I Ecclesiastes is my favorite book in the Bible. Well, you know, I'm big on the Gospels and stuff, too, but I really love this book. In fact, my life's verse, whatever your hand finds to do, do it with all your might, is from the book of Ecclesiastes. Ecclesiastes, for my cynical mind, uh, cleans it out and makes me think I'm not crazy. Uh, I look around and uh, see stuff falling apart and things that I cared about no longer in existence to say nothing of people. And so I'm a cynic. I don't have a very high view of human nature, and I'm more cynical about myself than anybody else. But as I read your book, I I saw things I've never seen before. I mean, I understood it in a way I've never seen before. I understood life better, and I understood what the preacher was saying. So, David, before we begin, I want to thank you for writing this book. What a dynamite book. Uh, Do you ever at 3 o'clock in the morning realize you're going to die and break out in a cold sweat? Um, You know, who was it that said, I don't mind dying, I just don't want to be there when it happens? Uh, Are you really uh, prepared for death? Yeah, thank you. Um, well, it's a pleasure to be with you. And I, I um, yeah, it's quite something to arrive on a radio show with a whole pile of strangers and be straight away talking about death, isn't it? Straight away. Um, <laughs> sure, right sure, right. Way to, sure way to make friends. Yeah, exactly. Um, I, I, I think that really is why Ecclesiastes is so striking, that it really can change your, we, we talked only about things being life-changing, changing your changing your life. Ecclesiastes is so striking because it really can change your death. Um, The the 3am question, of course, I lie there sometimes. Well, I think if I'm really honest, I don't think I ever lie there fearing my own death or agonizing about my own death. I I do, of course, lie there fearing that about my wife lying beside me or my, my children. I've got four kids, 14 down to eight. Um, And Ecclesiastes isn't, saying and never says death is okay and the death of the people you love is okay you know just get used to it you can be happy at the thought of that that that's not what ecclesiastes is saying it it is saying your your own death is something you can think clearly about in a way that stops you dreading it fearing it living as if it doesn't exist as if it's not coming um I think that's the key thing. That's the key takeaway. It, it, the message of Ecclesiastes is helping you think about your own death. Um, and you said there that you're an old you're an old cynic who doesn't like thinking about death. Older people don't like thinking about it. But I, I think it's mainly younger people who don't like thinking about it, isn't it? When you're when you're older, when you're older, you have to start thinking about it. It looks like it's it looks like it's real and like it's coming. But when you're a lot younger, you think this isn't happening at all. This will happen to other people, not me. And Ecclesiastes is the book that just presses pause in your life and says, hang on a minute, son, this is, this is coming to you too. And Mm -hmm. if you, if you prepare for it, the earlier you prepare for it, the earlier you accept that it's happening, the better your life will be. That that's the startling message of Ecclesiastes. You know, uh, and it's an aside, but it really isn't. Uh, The way one deals with one's mortality is to look at death and kiss death on the lips. And most people don't do that. I was kidding about the denial. Uh, You know, as you said, when you're old, you can't escape thinking about it. But I suspect, David, and you're considerably younger than me, that just working on this book, Uh, And you've worked on it a long time, even had to get extensions from your publisher, I read. (laughs) You uh, you've been dealing with death, kissing that demon on the lips for a long time. Has that been a real gift to you? Yeah, yes, it really it really has. Um, I I wish I could say I've lived as 
fully and as fruitfully as I try to outline in the book, you can live in the light of death, but my wife and kids will tell you I've still been as grumpy and sinful as, uh, you know, anybody who's never read Ecclesiastes or read my book. It, it hasn't changed my life in all the ways I would yet like it to, but it, it, it has certainly been an astonishing gift to me on many, many levels. Yeah, I'm really happy to tell you more about that. You know, one of the things, and we'll, and we'll talk about this on the other side of the break because we're running out of time here, but one of the wonderful thing about Ecclesiastes is the freedom it gives the believer to live life not just to go to church more and read the Bible more and pray more and be nicer, but the freedom to, to live life in its fullest as a gift that is given by God without ignoring the dark side of life where Ecclesiastes is quite clear. You don't have time to comment on what I just said. But you can, before we break, simply say, I agree with that, or I don't agree with that. I agree with that, 100%. You'll, <laughs> you'll be back in the next segment, and we'll be back too. The name of the book is called Living Life Backwards, How Ecclesiastes Teaches Us to Live in the Light of the End. Trust me, this is a great book and you need to get it. You need to study it and underline it before you die. We're leaving, but we're coming back. Thanks for joining us. We're glad you're here. We're hanging out with David Gibson. You can keep up with him on Twitter at David N G I B B O. And you can check out Trinity uh, Aberdeen dot org dot UK. And uh, you can look at what's happening in a great church, by the way. Um, David, uh, you include, of course, uh, uh, in Ecclesiastes, uh, discussion of that familiar kind of poetic uh, uh, discussion the, the preacher has about the seasons, contrasting seasons of life, the uh, time to be born, time to die, time to kill, and time to heal, and so forth. Um, and most people probably in the Western world whether believers or non-believers are familiar with that passage, but so often it's taken just uh, selected out and just that portion. And you say that's a real mistake, that the real interpretation and understanding of that comes with the rest of the verses uh, of that chapter. Can you kind of talk about that some? Yeah, thanks, George. I, that, that's a really good question. I, I don't know about what it's like in the States with you guys, but over here in the UK, and where I am in, in Aberdeen in Scotland, I've heard several funeral services where these verses are read. Um, you know, there, there's a there's a beauty to them, isn't there? A, a lyrical kind of flow, a time to be born, a time to die, a time to plant, a time to pluck up. For everything there is a season, a time for every matter under heaven. And I guess, uh, you know, you don't have to be Christian to find them interesting. I've heard them read by humanists at humanist funerals. The kind of, we, we come, we go, this is life. Here we are at a funeral today. This is this person's time to die. And, you know, but it totally misses what the writer of Ecclesiastes is, do, is doing with all of that. And, and it misses it on lots of levels. I've never heard those words read at the death of a, a child or a young person. It's okay to do them uh, at the death of an older person at a funeral. There's a kind of sense that there is a time for everything. This person's lived to a good old age. Um, what, what happens if you're standing at the grave of uh, somebody who's been taken from you completely prematurely, tragically, unexpectedly? 
it is it's not okay to say to human beings to bereaved parents at that moment oh well there is a time for everything you know um uh, uh, and the the writer of ecclesiastes would never say that to parents like that that's i don't think that's what he's doing with those words i i think he's saying that only if you realize that God is writing the story of the universe from beginning to end and has put all these temporal times into an eternal perspective, only then do the times of your life have any real true meaning. The, the only comfort you could ever give to parents standing at the graveside of a child taken from them is, is what the writer goes on to say, verse 11, God has made everything beautiful in its time. He has put eternity into man's heart, yet so that he cannot find out what God has done from beginning to the end. Sometimes you live in this world and you cannot tell how A, how B follows A, how C follows B. The, the, the seasons and rhythms of life just seem to totally take you by surprise. There seems to be no meaning to the time for everything under, under the sun. The meaning comes from the fact that God is the one who knows the beginning from the end. And somehow, in a way that we cannot fathom or understand, God is going to take every single event in this universe, in, a, in the time frame of our individual lives, and God is going to put them together in a way that will be beautiful from beginning to end. And unless you have that, that bigger perspective that moves beyond simply the times for everything under heaven, to see that God is the one putting all the times together into one coherent whole. Actually, the times can leave you completely blindsided in life, can't they? Um, it's why I, I think our, our response to the pandemic should be very different as believers from the perspective of the world around us, that the very best the world can do is to say, look, we've been here before, the Spanish flu, 1919, 21, whatever. And that's kind of as big as a perspective gets. But Christian people say, yeah, well, all of that. And God is writing the story of the universe that he's maybe doing something through this pandemic that nobody else can see yet. Maybe we won't know for generations. But God is God is in this. God is at work. God is stitching everything together in, into one coherent whole. And particularly as well, at the end of chapter three, the writer goes on to say, and what really gives all of that coherence, what brings comfort in all of that, is that at the end of it all, there will be judgment. So there is a time for everything under the sun, a time to seek, a time to lose, a time for war, a time for peace, a time to mourn, a time to dance. What, what if you have suffered terribly in one of those times, suffered terrible injustice, you know, the best, if, if you're going to stop at verse eight at a funeral, the best you can say is, you know, sorry, tough luck. Um, but if you keep reading in chapter three, the best that you can then say is that at the end of all those times, there is a loving and a righteous God who will bring everything to account in his courtroom. There will be justice and judgment at the end. So that, that that's kind of what I mean, George, about that's kind of a long answer to your question, but that's kind of what I mean about mm. how, how you need, to, you need to move beyond the, Yes, take in the beauty of the poetry, but you know, don't don't pack up and go home before you've had the punch of the prose that comes after it. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So, getting to the title, and, and maybe we can answer this fully on the other side. The 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 living life backward. You know, death is an absolute that we all have to to reckon with, um, and the beauty of an absolute is that it helps us measure things, you know, it help us, you know, a mile is always a mile, a pound is always a pound. Um, and, and death is, is no different in the sense that you can measure values against it. Is that the idea of the approach of the book to live life with that kind of larger perspective that, you know, we have a limited amount of time. Just, just tell us a little bit more about the, the, the concept of that, if, if, if you would, and we can maybe finish it on the other side. Yeah, I think it's the idea of in the book that God God has d death is not a value neutral thing that just means your heart stops, which is obviously what it means physically and biologically. Death is a theological entity that wasn't here at the beginning. God has placed it in the world as a form of His curse on on 
humanity's rebellion. And because God has put it in, God is doing something with that death. It, it is a limit God has placed on fallen creatures in their desire to be God. Because God is doing something with death, that makes it incredibly fruitful, actually, for us to reflect on what he's doing with it. Well, so good. Uh, this, uh, you know, if you're an existentialist, the fact of death leans or gives uh, importance to the now, uh, the minute, the second where you're living. But ultimately, if you're not a believer, uh, it's all meaningless. It doesn't mean anything, and it doesn't matter. So you have to face death, and you have to face that reality too, and we don't. <clears throat> so deal with it. <laughs> We're coming back to talk. Hey, you're listening. To Steve Brown, et cetera. And thanks for hanging out with us. I genuinely mean that. If uh, you could use an occasional reminder that God's not angry at you if you're a believer, then resolve to join our email list. Just go to keylife.org slash subscribe. Matthew, you might want to rephrase what you said uh, before the break and then have David comment a little bit more on that. Sure, sure. Yeah, that's my great radio experience is ask a big question and then give a tiny little window for you to. <laughs> so <laughs> just hitting on all of all the pistons. Uh, I, you know, I was just curious about uh, to tee up the question again, the approach of the book uh, Living Life Backward. You know, and you kind of got into it a little bit as, as far as explaining what that means, living in light of the fact that we have a finite amount of time here. Yeah, so it's 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 the message that God, God has put so that there's a kind of I mean, Steve said before the break about existentialism, there's a kind of nihilistic, atheistic worldview. Eat, you know, we're all going to die. So eat, drink, and be merry for tomorrow we die. What what it why how is the message of Ecclesiastes different from that? Because it, it does actually sound very similar. The parts of Ecclesiastes that seem to say that you're gonna die, so go eat, drink, enjoy life with your wife, because you don't know when you're gonna die. It does sound similar. The difference is that the the death that is coming is a death that God has placed in the world. It, it's God's intervention to say to fallen men and women who in the garden said to God, look. You, you've made a good start here, but you push off and we'll take it from here. We, we'll, we'll finish the project. We're in charge now. And God says, well, hang on. No, no. You, you've done what I told you not to do. De death is now a reality. And de the, the theological meaning of death is that it is God's no to our human attempt to live without him and be God's ourselves, to, to carry on the Babel project. Death is always there to say that, that that's not right, that, you know, you, you're not going to live forever. W once you realize that, that God is doing that with death, it, the message of Ecclesiastes takes that as a given. And then it says, so, so once you accept that you're not here to make a name for yourself forever, you're not here to live forever. You're not here to be the top dog, to be God. You're not here to control everything, to understand everything. Ecclesiastes says, I hope you can see that God is speaking to you through the coming reality of death. Death is like this constant reminder to you that you are just a creature and God is the creator and God is eternal and you are not. And once you see that, it, it, it begins to seep into your bones in a kind of liberating way where you realize, huh, I don't, I don't have to conquer the world. I don't have to have the answer to absolutely everything. I don't have to live forever. If God thinks I'm not important enough for me to have to live forever, what difference will that make? If I start accepting that I don't have to live forever, and you just begin, you begin to find it liberating you. It it means that you 
stop working as hard in a bad way. You come home earlier and spend time with your children. You give give away more of your money. You you stop striving in Ecclesiastes' words for two hands of gain, mm. and you just become happy with one. One is enough. I may not have everything I want, but at least I'm enjoying what God has given to me. But, that, that's kind of, does that make sense, Matthew? Yeah, it does. Of, it kind of just colors your entire uh, perspective on yeah. what we're after. That's, wow, that's actually very liberating. It's not sad at all. Wow. And, yeah. it, it, and David, it plays into the theme, uh, and that's what we're about at Key Life, of freedom and grace and joy. Yeah. Uh, you, you know, when you know you're going to die and you don't have to be God anymore, there is um, uh, the wine tastes better and the music is more danceable and yeah. the friends more important and the families uh, incredibly uh, a gift to all mm-hmm. of us. If we're yeah. going to die, if we're going to live forever, it's what the hey, man, I, I'll do that tomorrow or next day. I'll have yeah. time, but we don't have time. Yeah. And, uh, it's what everybody says, isn't it? You, we all know people who've had the had the the diagnosis that says you've only got six months left, and mm. you you just see it happen. Everything comes into focus. There's nobody in that situation is saying, "Do you know what? I wish I'd spent more time in the office. I wish I'd I wish I'd earned more money. I wish I'd." It, it all becomes about relationships. It becomes about the the good gifts that God has given. I wish I'd enjoyed this more, or I'm going to enjoy this more. Um, the message of Ecclesiastes is don't, don't wait for the deadly diagnosis because it, it's already been given. God pronounced it in the garden. It is coming to you. It, it is real. So accept that it's real now and live as if you've had that doctor telling you the, you know, um, the, the terminal diagnosis. You can actually get on with life yourself in a way that those people do when they receive that news. That's so that's profound. It really is. And uh, I personally believe that a lot of the tragedy and the anger and the hatred and the building of empires, that all of that is an effort to avoid facing the fact that it's one out of one. It does explain a lot of the shouting and a lot of the nonsense and the craziness go on. Keep on dancing. Don't look. It's gaining on you. Pretend it's not there and have another beer. (laughs) Mm, There's some attraction to that, but it's not good enough. We'll talk more about it on the other side of the break. Thanks for spending this hour with us. It, I told you at the beginning that it sounded like a downer, but it really isn't. Some of the most profound things that we've ever heard on this broadcast have been spoken by David and in his book, Living Life Backwards, how Ecclesiastes teaches us to live in the light of the end. And just as a side note, in the title, backwards is spelled backwards. And given my dyslexia, (laughs) this is the first cover that ever made sense. (laughs) Uh, Kathy? David, I would, um, I'd like for you to comment um, on the word vanity. Um, You uh, talk about that in your book and say that there's a problem with our understanding of the word vanity and you actually refer to the Hebrew word. And I just wondered if you would, you know, kind of um, pick that apart a little bit and give us yeah. some, what's going to be, I'm sure some really helpful information about that word. Yeah. Thank you. I think it, it, it comes right at the very start of the book, Ecclesiastes chapter one, verse one, vanity of vanities. If you're, if, if you're reading the 
uh, ESV, English Standard Version, meaningless, meaningless is the NIV. It, it, it's that word that put me off preaching it for uh, quite a long time. And when I started to preach it with a colleague, I just thought, what on earth are we going to do with this book? I, you know, what, what, as a young, young man, health, healthy, happily married, I just thought, how on earth am I going to say everything is meaningless? I, I, it's not meaningless. I'm, I'm quite happy, actually. Um, and w- what wavelength is this Bible book on? I couldn't quite get my head around it. And then the more I, I read and studied, the more I realized that, that for whatever reason, the particular English translations that have, we've gone with, va- vanity in the ESV, or, um, I mean, there, there is a reason why the translations do that. It's because the word is broad. They're trying to encapsulate a lot of different things in one, in a lot of different nuances in one English word. But the reality is that the, the, the Hebrew word for vanity or for meaningless, hevel, it is more commonly used in other places to refer to shortness of t- a time span rather than, um, you know, meaningless or even vanity. It, it, it tends to suggest, doesn't it? Like I say in the book, the, the philosophy student who comes home after one semester at university and tells his mum and dad, I've discovered the universe has no meaning. It's not meaningless in an existential sense. It's meaningless in a, a, a brevity of life sense. So um, to give you a couple of other examples, you've got um, uh, Psalm 39, behold, you have made my days a few hand breaths. My lifetime is as nothing before you. Surely all mankind stands as a mere breath, a mere hevel. A man goes about as a shadow. Uh, you get the same thing in Psalm 144. O oh Lord, what is man that you regard him or the son of man that you think of him? Man is like a breath, Hevel. And then it's il- illustrated in the second part. His days are like a passing shadow. So the, the, the meaning of that word has much more to do with brevity. It has much more to do with elusiveness. Just like life comes and goes really quickly, so life is hard to get your hands on. Um, so, you know, if you're to ever, if you were ever able to witness somebody smoking a pipe, for instance, and you see the smoke in the room and you think, I'm going to get hold of that and keep it in my pocket. You, you can't, can you? It's just there and then it's it's gone. And I think I think that's what Ecclesiastes is doing with that word. That that is what life is like. It's short and it it just seems to fall through your fingers. You know, so, some people get the statue, some people get the book named after them or the the football stand named after them. Some people's name gets memorialized forever, but 99% of us, you come, you go, and your great-grandchildren, great-great-grandchildren won't even know you you lived. That's that's what the word means. Mm. Wow. Does that, does that help? Does that make sense? Yeah. yeah. Oh, it does. Especially because Steve's... I'm going to throw away the ESV. I'm not going to use it anymore now that you have allowed <laughs> me to see the obvious error in the version that I use most of the time, but it's so good. And David, so Steve is a pipe smoker, so we see I, the I, we see the pipe smoke all the time. And they I keep trying to put it in very there deliberately. I saw that. Yeah. <laughs> well, you can't grasp can't grasp it, but you can certainly smell it all the time. <laughs> yeah, yeah. But, but David, it's expensive tobacco. They ought to be thankful. Quite, I could, quite right. I could. Yeah. I could smoke your tobacco, the Presbyterian mixture. I was, I was just about foul. to say that's. Oh, is it? That's the, only, yeah. that's the only type. That's the only type I have. The only type I have is Presbyterian. I have to get new stuff. Okay. Listen, you know, I was thinking as uh, we've been talking during this hour that this, if we could ever get through, is the message. I mean, this is an incredible message of evangelism. When And it always does. When the meaning we create begins to run out and we realize it, uh, Ecclesiastes is the answer. I mean, it's incredible. you got to mention Jesus here or there. But this will bring a pagan to, um, uh, to, um, to reality quickly. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. I, I find when we preached it that... Uh, and I've been preaching 15 years and I did this quite early on. 
very few things connect with people like this material does. The wisdom literature, you know, yeah. for those of you guys who are preachers, for those who are listening, w- wisdom literature connects with people in a profound way because it's earthy. It's right down where people are living and pastors think we want to do justification by faith, election, predestiny. You know, let's do Romans, Ephesians. Fine. You've got to do them. But pe- people's eyes light up when you're talking Proverbs, Song of Songs, Ecclesiastes, because um we we get the, we get those things immediately we know exactly what's going on in those they connect to our to our life and for, for for sharing the gospel they're an excellent way in with people to say look the world that we christian people live in is it's your world it's the same world we're all going to die together so can i help you think about your death well better than you have been and and using using it to point people to the lord jesus is 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 a wonderful thing to do Oh, it really is. And, you know, we're seeing a veritable kind of semi-awakening among young people across America. And it's right at this point, you know, they're singing, but they don't know it. What's it all about, Alfie? And they're beginning to realize if there's not something more than this, then this is not worth it. And the suicide rate goes up. The depression, the uh, psychosis, the neurosis, all of that stuff. And I'm going to start giving your book to my pagan friends because I'm so religious. I don't have many. I'm going to see who's the most pagan on this staff and make sure they read this book. (laughs) David, you're a delight. And it's amazing to me, we can talk to somebody in Scotland, see you and have this kind of conversation. And I know how busy you are. Thank you so much for taking your real time pleasure. to be with us. It's been lovely. No, thank thank you. you very much for having me. It's been wonderful. Really so we can do, do it, it again. again. Yeah. You keep yeah, writing please. books, we'll keep talking. Okay. Guys, we're gonna okay. tell you who we're gonna do it unto next week. So you're gonna be amazed, uh, surprised. Pleased, so don't go away. That was new to me. A lot of it, not new in terms of that I'm going to die. That's old stuff. I know that. Uh, Or the reality of what's on the other side. Ecclesiastes says, eat, drink, and be merry. Then you die, and you eat, drink, and you can be merry for all of eternity. But what was said at the end of this thing is really important. If you're listening on the radio or you've turned on um, our uh, video version of this, and you're not a believer, and it eats away with at you sometimes, uh, you might want to get this book. It makes you think. And it's not altogether happy thoughts, but it can become meaningful thoughts that are almost profound in the way you live your life. I think, uh, I think everybody at some time during their lives stop and sing that old song. What's it all about, Alfie? Or if uh, Peggy Lee, uh, is this all there is? And when you start asking those questions, you're on the right road. You're beginning to ask a question that could literally change your life, make it more full and free uh, to know you're forgiven and free and that there's meaning to every bit of it makes all of the difference in the world. Um, I wish I'd read this book before I finished the manuscript on my last one, Laughter and Lament, The Touchstones to Radical Freedom. Kathy, who's going to be on next week? Well, I noticed you said before the break that 
people were going to be surprised. And and actually, you are the one who's going to be surprised because I have no earthly idea. (laughs) (laughs) Um, You know, something happens in January. Everybody goes into hibernation or something after the holidays. They don't have any time. And it's really hard. I don't maybe it's us. You know, it's really hard to find people that want to be on our program. Actually, that's not true. We just have a lot of we have a lot of irons in the fire and we don't have anything confirmed yet. But we will be brilliant. I mean, there's oh, just no well, doubt gonna, about I that. I tell you what, we're going to all confess our three greatest sins publicly. You know, you know what? The what last time we two? the last time we did um, we'll a show, another. yeah, the last time we did a show with just us, we had some great numbers, didn't we, Matthew? You know, Kathy, it's not about the numbers, but uh, yeah, we yeah, killed you're going to yeah. die. Oh, <laughs> really? That's what you, that's what you said in the meeting the other day. I know. How great it was. <laughs> Guys, we're going to go. We're going to come back same time, same place next week. And it's our fond hope that you will join us. Between now and then, don't do anything we wouldn't. And that gives you a wide, wide berth.